Um, it's time to, uh, yesterday, if you were in here, we saw a uh, Teddy Ruxpin get hacked. Um, and uh, today we're going to do uh, something a little bit different. We're going to do um, power plants. So uh, this is going to be very exciting. Let's give Joss and Marina a big round of applause. Have a good time. Good morning. Thank you so much to all of you for coming here. So today we will be like we will present you like what it an effort what it takes to design embedded exploits to actually cause physical damage in industrial facility from the beginning to the end. So briefly about ourselves, I will let Jos to present. Yeah, so my name is uh, Jos Wetzels. I'm an independent security researcher with Midnight Blue, where I mainly focus on different kinds of embedded systems, industrial control systems, automotive, IoT, and I previously worked as a researcher at the University of Critical Infrastructure Security. So and my name is Marina Krotofil. Um I've been doing, uh, my major f uh, specialization is physical damage, and I've been doing it for more than eight years. Uh, <clears throat> I presented a lot of works at Black Hat and DEF CON. And so how this combination of us is came together is, on one hand, yours can reverse engineer and de uh, develop like exploits and implants for any embedded system in the world. Uh, <clears throat> however, like, what exactly do you want to do on that device? And I am my specialization, hey, here's this power plant, chemical plant, or traffic light system, robotic system, how exactly you want to cause physical damage. So I will be design and engineer this exploitation scenario to cause physical damage, and then at the end I will come up with a set of algorithms which need to be implemented, and with a long list of tasks which needs to be executed on that embedded system. So with that wish list, I would go to a guy like yours and say, hey, this is what I need to do on that device. And maybe like somewhere we will also meet in between when you look at the design of the device, like, hey, the specific uh, design features of the device can be probably used to accomplish like simultaneously several tasks. So this is where we would be working together. So this is a, how the combination came into place. Um, and so this is how we will be presenting the presentation. So after the introduction in industrial control system and safety systems, by the way, how many of you have heard Triton? And I hope that everybody. Good, because that was our motivation. We also wanted to show, like in the mass media, this uh, Triton exploit was pos like described as like so sophisticated, like only state sponsor, only a few people, and we will show you if it's really so. Um, so <clears throat> after the introduction, we will go into the device exploitation because at the end you need to obtain code execution on the device. So after you have code execution, then you start already developing, for example, implant like uh, backdoors like and uh, payloads which actually uh, uh, targeted like designed for physical damage and of course conclusions in the end. As you already probably noticed I'm speaking very fast and there is reason for that because the topic which we are presenting to you is extremely complex but we still wanted to show you the process from the beginning to the end and still of course without deep details and it's already a lot. So it will be fast paced talk. Uh, however, again, the motivation was to show you the full process so that you could see it from the beginning to end. And we will be posting even longer version of the slides uh, after this talk because we have to cut out certain information. And if you're interested, you can go and review it again. So introduction. So what are the industrial control systems? Well, you probably all know, but it's important to set up a vocabulary so that all of us operate for this talk, operate on the same terms. So uh, industrial control systems, those are computerized systems and network which control physical process. So typically, if you talk about industrial organization, there will be corporate network, there will be another network which is called SCADA or control network. And even though this is the same looking computers, one will be called information technology and another will be called operational technology or OT. Nevertheless, that is still all computing devices and the guys who deal with those systems are studying typically something like computer science. And as long as we are moving towards physical process, this is already engineering science and it's completely different. Um, so, the, low, uh, the closer we come into the physical process, the computing devices which actually monitor, uh, monitor and control physical process, they look already like this, and they called, we typically know them as um, embedded systems. So they don't have uh, operating system as we know you, as, as we know it, so operating system uh, which actually 
<clears throat> run the device and execute the programs is called firmware. And since these systems are real-time systems, the entire firmware must be loaded and executed in the memory at all times. So, <clears throat> um, uh, so on one hand, the attacker needs to execute code, so the attack will be executed on this embedded system, so it's still cyber domain, in order to cause it physical damage and basically uh, damage, for example, the machinery and operate the machinery <clears throat> uh, as needed. And so when, for example, when the attacker is like uh, going into the like uh, penetrating financial sector, his goal is to steal money in some form. So when the attacker is penetrating the industrial network, his goal is to cause some sort of form of physical damage in the do uh, physical domain. It could be also economic damage, like spoiling the product. However, in the mass media, typically this physical damage is depicted as a big explosion. Um, so <clears throat> I see a threat landscape has changed in the past eight years. So I started doing this type of security before it was fashionable and nobody knew about it. While like in IT domain there was like crazy amount of hacking happening all the time. Like industrial control systems lived in bubbles, nobody knew about them. And then Stuxnet has happened. So uh, it seemed to be like Stuxnet was kind of a trigger and a tipping point because we started seeing more and more publicly known espionage attacks and somewhere like we started seeing first publicly known like uh, activities related also already to recon uh, of the operational technology system so and from 2015 it started to happen and so there was two power grid attacks in 15 and 16 and in 17 basically uh, it, uh, it was announced at the end of 2017 Triton has happened uh, what it was, the attacker tried to uh, install backdoor or remote access trojan on a safety controller. Uh, and it was a big thing because it's, uh, <clears throat> it was picked up by pretty much every mass media, including Wall Street journals, which said that that is very, very, very alarming situation. And uh, why was Triton so special? Uh, because it does targeted safety instrumented system. So what does it mean exactly for us? Uh, physical processes are inherently hazardous. So it means that there is like, like uh, toxic flammable liquids, um, f fires and explosions, electrical hazard, moving parts in the machinery. So there are a lot of layers of safety protections to prevent harm or maybe even uh, casualties to uh, humans, first of all, and secondly, to pre prevent uh, environmental damage and also machinery because it's expensive to kill uh, <clears throat> machinery. So there are uh, layers of protection starting with the design of the process, then we have a control loops, then we have a human operator who uh, reacts to the alarm. But <clears throat> as soon as like control system and human operator are no longer able to control the process in a safety manner, we have so-called safety instrumented system that is independent control system which reacts on the hazardous condition and tries to prevent it. So as you can see, this is the last lane, line of defense before hazardous accident is already happening. So, and the attacker was apparently uh, was trying to, disab uh, to disable the system. So that is actually attack on the civilian, uh, <clears throat> civilians, which is not good. So uh, previously, so safety instrumented systems are software systems, and because it is a line, line, line of defense, typically it is, re mm, it is recommended that they would be run on the uh, isolated and segmented network. But for ease of design and for ease of maintenance, they often are connected together to the main control system. Uh, and, um, <clears throat> So, and that allows the attacker to obtain remote access to safety instrumented systems. So, and they, that was a Triconix from Schneider, and it is a very critical safety instrumented system of <clears throat> safety integrated level three, which is only 2% of all hazardous situation, uh, for example, in oil, uh, uh, <clears throat> ease of that uh, severity. So it, it, it's very critical safety systems. Triconix is everywhere. For example, you could find it on the swimming ships and so on. So the attacker obtained remote access to the uh, engineering station, which was connected to the safety controller. So they got the ability to communicate to safety controllers. And what uh, <clears throat> 
an attack attempted to inject a passive backdoor, or some people refer to it as a remote access trojan, which would allow attacker to read arbitrary memory, write into the memory, for example, uh, shell code for the attack, and then they execute that code. Uh, <clears throat> so um, now, so even if you have the backdoor, it really means nothing to you because. I mean, unless you know what you want to achieve in the plant, the backdoor is actually absolutely useless and harmless. So attack scenario depends on attacker goal. And sometimes it means explosion, <laughs> but in most cases it does not because you don't need to over engineer if you just want to send a warning sign to your enemy or whatnot. Uh, and like some, you can achieve some simple like attacks like do not press, there are certain buttons on the HMIs which are so descriptive, like stop, start, you can press it and uh, you achieve some effect, but you know, that is not a, la a long lasting effect. So like, yes, the first cyber physical attacks were happening at the HMI, then the attackers move their exploits, for example, <clears throat> in destroy or crash override, they were executing the attack already at the level of the industrial protocols, but now we have Triton, which is already on the embedded system. So what's going on? Why the attacker is already moving their exploits into the embedded systems? And we will explain. So industrial processes are very complicated and they actually build inherently and designed to be robust and recoverable. So uh, if the attacker wants to achieve any uh, significant long lasting damage, uh, they actually need to obtain very uh, specific process, like very detailed process comprehension, the design, uh, the dynamic behavior of the uh, process physics and so on. So for example, like what causes a pipe to explode? Well, what causes the right pipe to explode? And then what causes the right pipeline to explode at the right time? And suddenly the complexity is increasing. So industrial control systems operate on the control loop uh, principle. So uh, control systems and human operators, they use sensors to observe the state on the process. And then control system compute the commands to instruct actuators to control the process and bring it into the right state. So, in a nutshell, when the attacker is start designing engin uh, or engineering damage scenario, there are a huge number of tasks which he has to accomplish, <clears throat> like starting from, of course, manipulating the process, but then the attacker needs also to obtain a feedback loop to know whether the process is moving into the right state and he is successful. Uh, I've been doing this for many, many years, and I've designed a lot of <laughs> damage scenarios, and I can tell you that obtaining feedback look is, was for, uh, one of the most hardest tasks to achieve because mostly sensors which are installed there in the plant, they're useful because the attack is something always weird, and they're not, the plant was not uh, designed to measure something weird going on. So you have to do it indirectly. And of course, because you are, trying to bring the process into the wrong state, into the harmful state, the control system and human operators and safety system, they will try to fight you back and to bring process back into the normal state. So the attacker also have to prevent the response. And Triton falls into this category, preventing response, because they wanted to uh, prevent response from the safety systems. So in a nutshell, the cyber-physical attack, or damaging attack, that will be a collection of clandestine control loops, because the, con the attacker is becoming a control system. And you have to have the cycle of observation and, and manipulations to achieve a safe state. So attack timing is crucial. So because process is not vulnerable at all times, so you have to find that vulnerable time. Uh, and uh, when the attack has to be execution, executed, the attack coordination is critical. As you have seen, there have been a lot of tasks. And for example, observation is of state eight and component, uh, component B needs to trigger payload X, Y, Z. Uh, so this requires very granular control across the entire process and to manage uh, like tasks quantity and timing. So there was a very nice presentation, even though I've been presenting on that uh, topic a lot of times, so like many times. So there have been a nice presentation from Jason Larson who decided to compare different uh, damage scenarios and he came up with this timing and state, di state diagram when he divided all the control uh, damage tasks in, uh, into uh, damage scenario into different tasks where he also tried to map like, hey, this is a set of tasks which I need to execute. How do I map them now to the different device and to different implants? And uh, so, <clears throat> 
basically, as soon as you, as amount of tasks which you need to execute to achieve damage is becoming large, you need to have an implant. Because like it's giving separate tasks is will you will not be able to coordinate them. So and uh, this also allows you uh, uh, it allows you actually to coordinate. So you can easily then install the coordination between the implant via the communication links, or you can implement the routine to detect specific state. So uh, and it's also much more stealthy because you don't have. Uh, <clears throat> Like anomalous, you do not create create an anomalous network traffic. Uh, so, but before, like, in order to actually achieve this, to e implement an implant, you first have to ex uh, exploit the device. And you better enjoy extreme programming because those devices are extremely small, have very limited resources, they're packed with the functionality. So you first have to actually find something what device does not need, eliminate it so that you could pu put your actual exploitation code. So at the end, Jason came up with this diagram where he has like put a score on different tasks and he compared the reliability because it's not only the reliability of the attack scenario, but it's also reliability of your exploit or implant on the device. And so basically, it's kind of you have to find this trade off like what is the most reliable attack uh, implant and uh, attack damage scenario and implant stability. So now, after this <laughs> long <laughs> introduction, I am giving back to Yoss, and he will walk you through the device exploitation and designing, like basically implementing. So now I have my wish list of tasks, and I'm giving it to him to implement. All right, thank you, Marina. So before we can do all this, yeah. <laughs> So before we can get you know, to the cool stage where things are actually exploding, we'll have to get to another cool stage, which is exploiting the device. And basically, the process is as follows, and I'll walk through these steps. And we start by obtaining the necessary material. So we need a couple of things before we can devise an exploit and an implant. And the first thing we'll need is documentation, and a lot of it. You know, um, developer's guide, planning and installation manuals, all that kind of stuff. And yeah, in the case of Triconex, uh, it was very useful that these things are safety certified at a certain level, and that means that all of the documents were available on the website of the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So very detailed information was out there. In other cases, you might have to buy it, but this is the first step you go about. Then the second step is obtaining the engineering software. So these devices, they're connected to a workstation running, I don't know, Windows XP, with some software that is used to program them. And this software usually contains the functionality for talking to this device and the protocols you want to take a look at. So you obtain this by just going to the vendor website or asking them nicely, which is the easiest route. Or if you're already com compromised asset owner networks, you might take it from their own network because you're in there already, so why not grab a souvenir? Um, or you might go to the various sketchy sources on the internet, like eBay or Alibaba, or open directories hosting this kind of stuff. So, you know, it's usually relatively easy to come by. In the case of Triconex, uh, we found a TriStation software for the equivalent of three US dollars on some Chinese website. So, yeah, that was relatively easy. And then we have to obtain the device, and that's a little trickier because you're not going to find that kind of stuff at a yard sale or in a corner shop or whatever. It's very expensive, and you might have to buy multiple multiple copies because you might have to do a teardown or you might break a device etc cetera, etc cetera. so ideally you buy it directly from the vendor but if you're a nation state sponsored attacker you don't maybe want to directly do that so you need straw men or you buy it at a bankruptcy auction or again eBay or Alibaba are your friend so here you can see I'm not sure if it's yeah it's all coming up it, it's relatively expensive in most cases, uh, a couple of thousand bucks for, for one of these controllers, and you need multiple parts to put the whole thing together. So it's, it's not you know, very cheap. Then you need to obtain the device firmware, the, the, the stuff that runs on the device itself. So you have various options here. You can sometimes download it from the vendor websites uh, or extract it from some update utility. That's, that's the easy uh, approaches. Or you might have to extract it from the flash chip on the device itself, go the hardware hacking route. And this can become very complicated because in a worst case scenario, you'll have encrypted firmware, you'll have chip readout protection, and you need to bypass it and do side channel attacks and all that kind of stuff. But for Triconex, that was not necessary because there was no readout protection on the flash. You could just desolder it, put it into an adapter, and use a universal serial programmer, and you'd be good. Or you could just get it from the firmware update utility, which also holds it all. So, you know. 
Um, the second step you have to do is usually device teardown and PCB analysis. So we need info on what kind of microcontroller is on this device. Uh, we need the device functional domain, so what is happening where on this device. Uh, we need to know about interesting interfaces like UART, JTAG, what have you. And sometimes we're lucky if it's an FCC certified device, you have an FCC ID and you get like internal photos and documentation on the FCC website. Sometimes other people have done your job for you and you have public teardowns and that's very nice. Um, in the case of TriConnect, the planning and installation guide has very uh, detailed internal block diagrams, and that helps a lot because, you know, that, that prevents you from or uh, saves you the effort of, of opening it up. But in some cases, we're not so lucky, and we will have to do teardowns. And now, people who don't come from a hardware hacking background, they're usually terrified of it, but it's not that complicated in most cases. Um, you know, like the picture shows, it's RAM, flash, or you Google it. Um, and, and there is this, this persistent narrative that, you know, especially among some OT people, that, you know, ICS devices, they're all different and operational technology, it's not like uh, the embedded devices you're used to. But for our purposes, it's like all the IoT devices out there that are getting hacked by the billions every day. For example, take these, three, these two uh, PLCs by Schneider Electric, the Modicon M238 and M3, M340. Um, usually you have a central processor module which does all the heavy lifting and then you have a couple of input output modules which you stitch onto it uh, on the side as you can see on the right of the slide. Uh, you might have an integrated uh, ethernet uh, connector as you can see on the right example or maybe you have a dedicated module uh, that does the ethernet stuff and then connects to the main module over serial link. And internally they typically look something like this. Uh, so you have a couple of IO pins, you got your serial link or ethernet link or whatever and then you have a microcontroller um, in the middle and typically this microcontroller will run the main firmware which has the operating system and some of the application stuff like maybe a web server or an FTP server or whatever. Um, and then you typically have a logic handling chip uh, which might be an FPGA or another microcontroller executing the actual programs that this thing is, uh, is configured and programmed in. Now this might differ between PLCs because you know this is a generalization but it roughly comes down to something like this. And for TriConnects it looks like this. So you have three main processors and they communicate over TriBus, which is uh, an internal bus that does some voting on input values for consistency. And it has a triple modular redundancy architecture to ensure that you know uh, a vote of two out of three overrides um, any errors that are introduced there. Um, yeah, that's, that's basically what it looks like, the main processor. Um, and there you have it. it, it runs a PowerPC chip and you have a dedicated other chip for in input, output and communication stuff. And we'll delve into this a little bit later when it becomes relevant. So the first thing you want to look at for most ICS stuff is reverse engineering of all the protocols they talk to. Um, because in many cases, um, these are legacy and proprietary protocols, usually ports of old serial protocols that have been retrofitted onto Ethernet. They control very sensitive functionality, like starting and stopping the PLC, updating the firmware, and so on. Uh, and you might uh, find a way to get into the device itself by remote code execution uh, here, and that's what we want. So the first thing we need to know when encountering a protocol we don't know is knowing the packet structure and the semantics. So we can do this in a couple of ways and you know this is, this is a very quick generalization but usually you go about comparing it to functionally similar protocols that have been documented. So if it's a port of an old serial protocol, maybe take a look at you know what that looked like and, and what you can recognize uh, in there. Uh, test for common encoding structures like TLV, sequential identifiers, uh, checksums, any entropic analysis for uh, fields that integrate, uh, indicate cryptographic functionality. Uh, or you might want to do a differential analysis of functional batches of packets. So you have like one packet that corresponds to starting the PLC, one that corresponds to stopping the PLC in different kind of conditions and then see what kind of uh, bit fields in the packets change and, and what you can make of that. And like Rob Savoy said, believe it or not, if you stare at the hex dumps long enough, you start to see the patterns. And that is definitely true for PCAP only analysis, as you can see here. It's, it's basically like looking at the matrix. Now, ideally, you want to assist this, this traffic only analysis with binary reverse engineering because you want to, your reconstruction to be complete and sound. You want to write a reliable exploit, not because you don't want to fuck things up, but because you don't want to fuck things up for yourself. Um, so a PCAP only analysis can be incomplete, inaccurate or opaque. Uh, you know, you can have undocumented or rare behavior that you don't see in the field but that's in there and you're interested in. Uh, you might guess at semantics that might not actually be what you think it is. There might be encryption, compression, blah, 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 blah. And most importantly, PCAP only analysis damages your sanity. So you want to do some binary reverse engineering, which does that to a lesser extent. 
Um, so in the case of TriConnect, the TriStation software has a communications DLL, and uh, this has all the juicy stuff we need. It's a single DLL in the engineering software, and it has debug symbols, so that greatly eases our life. And as you can see on, on the slide, I hope it's, uh, it's, it's visible, um, basically all these functions, they have a good semantic mapping between the functionality it does, like starting the PLC, stopping the PLC, downloading the control logic, and the function code within the protocol itself. So you can relatively easily identify all that functionality. And you can see that the attacker probably went about it this way. Now, the, the benefit for attackers is that you don't need to fully reverse engineer the protocol. You only need to understand a few interesting packet types because we don't want to craft a full protocol parser, we want to craft an exploit. So I don't care about all, all the rest, I care about like that, that one packet type that does the, the good stuff. Now, when it comes to vulnerability discovery, which is typically the step that, that comes after this, um, the next step is getting code execution, right? And ideally, this is a pre-authentication vulnerability. As we'll see, pre-auth is a relative concept in the ICS world. Um, and in many cases, ICS vulnerabilities are often a byproduct of the reverse engineering. So you, you won't need to go about, in most cases, about fuzzing or, or uh, static analysis of the firmware. In many cases, it's insecure by default. There's ancient, ancient legacy shit everywhere, and you shake a stick at it, and vulnerabilities fall out. So let me briefly drink something. So <clears throat> an example of this, for example, is the uh, Moxa endport serial to Ethernet Wi-Fi converter. Uh, you plug a serial cable in, converts it to Ethernet. Um, it has a web interface with broken authentication, so it hashes on the client side. That's good. Um, once you're in, you can do command injection in the ping test form. So you get your code execution right there. Uh, other example, the Opto uh, energy monitoring and control device used in fairly sensitive environments. It's got FTP, it's got a proprietary protocol without authentication. Now the thing is you can configure FTP with a password, you can enable uh, IP filtering, all that kind of stuff, but then you can use this unauthenticated proprietary protocol to disable IP filtering, enable FTP, and ask the credentials nicely, you know, and then you get them. And you can use the FTP to upload a new uh, piece of firmware and reflash the device over FTP and there's no firmware signing. So so again, that's easy code execution right there. Another example, in case you, you're not believing me yet, uh, the Modicum Quantum PLC, uh, that's a large PLC for process applications. It has FTP with hard-coded credentials, which allows you to read and write configuration, firmware, what, what have you. It has a Telnet with a hard-coded backdoor, and that's actually a C interpreter, which, you know, is nice. Um, it also has an unauthenticated proprietary Modbus extension for starting and stopping the PLC, overriding the programmable logic. There's basically a gazillion ways to get code execution on this thing. And finally, to drive the point home, another serial to Ethernet converter uh, by Adventech. Uh, it has a web interface, again, and, and the nice thing is that if anyone unlocks the web interface on one PC, let's say a legitimate operator, it's disabled for everyone. So, you know. Uh, and then you have a command injection in the email setup, uh, email alert setup form, and again, easy code execution right there. I mean, you get the idea. It's like shooting fish in a barrel, right? Um, and the, for Trident, it was basically the same thing. It was an execute my packet police vulnerability. So the vulnerability was a freebie of the protocol reverse engineering. You have this safety program download functionality, which is how the engineers put like the actual logic on the thing. And it has no authentication. And the safety logic that gets downloaded to the device has no secure signing. Right. So you can basically skip all the way from reverse engineering to exploit development. And that's neat from an attacker point of view, not so neat from a defender point of view. And then that brings us to exploit development. So after we find a suitable vulnerability uh, and we get our code execution, we need to craft an exploit to, to actually, you know, not execute just the logic we want, but execute, you know, the instructions on the microcontroller we want. Um, and how, how, how would this look like in the case of Triton? Well, Triton has safety and control applications, which are developed in one of these uh, IEC languages. Uh, many of them look like graphical language, like you can see on the, the bottom of the slide. And they typically get compiled and downloaded and executed on the main processor there. And that's nice, because that gives you another exploit development freebie, because you don't need to break out of any sandboxes, you don't need to exploit any runtimes. And because on, in the case of the TriConnex controller, the logic was executed on the same chip that the operating system was executed on, you don't need to hop across any chip perimeters. You're right where you want to be. 
So Triton did have to, to add some additional functionality, so it doesn't overwrite the original programming, but it appends to it. And the reason why it did this is because it allows the safety logic to continue running without interruption. Because once you're implanting this device, you don't want everything to stop and potentially already cause uh, a process shutdown. You want to be stealthy, at least at that point. Another complication is the key switch on the Triconex controllers. So these devices have a physical key switch that allows you to, to set it to a certain mode. And only if it's set into the programming mode, then you can actually download new logic to it. And this is something that will be relevant later when we discuss uh, uh, the payloads. Another complication of, of embedded exploitation in general is the heterogeneity. Um, so embedded devices are far more heterogeneous than general purpose ones. You deal with a billion architectures from ARM to, to MIPS to PowerPC to, to whatever, uh, a billion kind of, of operating systems like VxWorks or QNX or even custom operating systems. And in the case of Triconex, that means that you have different architectures and operating systems between different versions. So uh, version 9 had a national semiconductor chip, but version 10 and 11 had power PC, and for the attacker, this means that scaling the attack requires writing and modifying payloads and implants for each different version. So there's some effort involved there. And that brings us to the development of the implant and the OT payload. And uh, you know, that's, 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 that's the stage that's close to what Marina mentioned of mapping like the TSD to the implants on the devices. And then we get to this stage. Now we have code execution. We can run arbitrary PowerPC shellcode. So now what? Well, ex exploitation is just one step among many. So uh, for complicated OT payloads, we will need to develop this implant and then after that craft the OT payload. Um, we have different kind of strategies here, so we can directly implant the OT payload straight away uh, after exploiting the device, or we can implement a backdoor, which would allow us to keep the, the OT payload a secret until you know zero hour, and basically provide you with kill switch capabilities, or in, in the jargon of some people, a dormant cyber pathogen. Um, that basically would allow you at a later stage to execute any kind of payload you'd want to. Um, the second thing we'll have to decide on is whether we'd go for cross-boot persistence, uh, which would require modifying the flash and we need enough space there to, to insert uh, the implant, or, which is what Triton did, we just go fully memory resident. Uh, that requires executable RAM, um, but it does mean that on reboot the implant is gone. Now for safety controllers this is not that relevant because these have an extremely high uptime. So even if it would be gone upon reboot, you know, it's probably going to be there all the time anyway. Uh, this has the added benefit for the attacker that it does complicate forensics. Um, the, the other thing you want to think about when designing an implant is the scalability of the implant. So you want to target devices that are common throughout ICS. So not only for one particular facility you might be interested in, but across different kind of facilities, different kind of industries. And Triconex fits this bill. So there are 18,000 or more than 80,000 um, uh, Triconex systems in over 80 countries. So having these kind of capabilities is, is very interesting from a strategic point of view. Um, you also want to target, if you're targeting software instead of controllers, you want to target the software uh, that is common throughout ICS, so used across multiple vendors. So protocol and connectivity stacks are usually uh, reused by multiple vendors, so you know having exploits for that kind of stuff really uh, scales well. And the same goes for control runtimes or, or the operating systems in question. Um, you basically want to construct an arsenal of exploits and implants against common devices and software stacks, because that means that it is a one-time upfront investment. And now, there is no huge turnover in these devices. These, these have an extremely long field uh, life. They, they get deployed for 10, 20 years. They don't get updated very often, you know, if, if there are even updates out there. So if you invest once in an arsenal for, let's say, all safety controllers that are relevant in the market right now, it's going to be an investment that's going to be paying off for a long time. So Triton makes more sense as a tool in such an arsenal than a very expensive one-off that was engineered for this particular attack. So that brings us to the reverse engineering of the ICS firmware. Uh, the first thing you'll have to do is extracting the firmware. So you have to determine the firmware format and then unpack. Uh, sometimes there will be firmwares for multiple chips on the board or data blobs and they're glued together and you'll have to get them out of the firmware. And then you'll have to do the decompression and the decryption if, if there is any uh, of that present. Uh, this might be simple, you know, keys might be present in a firmware uh, loading utility or you might have to actually do side channel attacks. In the case of Triconex this was very easy because the firmware was unencrypted. So, you know, basically this step could be skipped. Uh, the step that you do after that is pre-processing the firmware. So you need to obtain a memory map. You need to know where on this chip does the ROM live, where does the RAM live, where does the external memory live, the special purpose registers for interacting with peripherals, 
all that kind of stuff. And you typically get this from the data sheet. So very important if you do this kind of stuff, you need to learn to love reading data sheets. So after you know basically the lay, the lay of the land here, um, you go about identifying the base address. So you need to know where this particular firmware image is loaded into memory. Now there are many approaches here, and, and this is a gross oversimplification, but we simply don't have the time to go into all the details. But this can be as simple as, you know, being loaded at a chip fixed address. Uh, you can reverse engineer the update utility and see uh, where it places it, or you can extract it from something like the interrupt factor table, or the bootloader, or self-relocating code, jump tables, string tables, all that. Let's consider, for example, uh, this RTU firmware uh, piece. This is a piece of firmware for a remote terminal unit that's deployed somewhere in the field. Uh, it's ARM-based, and we have this piece of firmware and we don't know what the base address is. So we load it just at address zero. And then we see all these, these different, uh, uh, basically, branches. Does anyone recognize what this is? Yeah, a couple of people. Well, yeah, that's the interrupt vector table of, of um, of an ARM chip. So the first, uh, the first entry is uh, a branch to the reset handler. And basically, if we look at the offset, we have 100 as an offset here, and here we have 102. And if we look at that offset, we see a lot of toggling with like these, these special purpose registers, and that's very typical behavior of a reset handler. So if we then deduct uh, uh, the, the, the 1,000, basically that becomes the base address. We rebase the firmware image, and we can see that it cleans up nicely. Now we know how to load it into memory. So after you've done this, you know where to load it, you know where everything is, is laid out, you have to reconstruct the complete code and data topology of the firmware. Uh, firmware images are not neat executable formats, like, like PE or ELF or Mac O. I mean, your mileage might vary for what qualifies as a neat executable format, but this definitely is not it. Um, we will have to heuristically identify the functions in there, the strings, the jump tables, the structs, and all that kind of stuff. Um, on the upside, this is, this is usually the bulk of the work, doing all this reverse engineering. Uh, the upside is that we don't need to reverse engineer the full firmware, only up until readiness for this next step. We, because we want to hunt for interesting functionality. We want to reverse engineer in a sniper-like fashion. Uh, so we want to know how, how does the control runtime work that actually interprets and handles this, this safety logic. Where are the protocol parsers? Um, where are the, the communications and peripheral I.O. handlers? Where is any security or safety-related functionality there? So what would this look like for the Triton X3008, which was targeted by the Triton uh, attack? Well, um, it, uh, it's firmware that's PowerPC-based, which is nice, because uh, the Hacksrace decompiler is available for that, and that saves you a lot of uh, work. It's not a substitute for reading the disassembly, but it eases your navigation uh, across this firmware. Uh, it uses a custom uh, operating system with 27 system calls, and some sparse documentation uh, exists. Thank you, NRC. Um, basically, this is what the operating system looks like. You have a scan task, a communications task, and a background task, and we're really only interested in the scan task, which fetches inputs from shared memory, which is where all the, the uh, analog and digital I.O. gets uh, put. Then we do a tribus transfer for the voting on, on consistency, um, and then we run the actual control logic, and then we send the outputs again to the, to the uh, shared memory, and basically this implements all these control loops. Um, so the targets here would have been the memory layout and management because we want you know, to achieve this memory residency, so we need to know how to do that. Um, then we need to look for consistency checks and diagnostics functionality for implant stability. We don't want anything uh, messing with our implant while we're running. Um, we need to know where the network command dispatcher functionality is because we want to be able to communicate with it over the network and achieve that. Um, we want to be able to know if there's any privilege mode management. We want to, to do anything we can on this device. So if there is privilege management, we want to escalate them. Yeah. Um, so, and possibly, finally, we need to know the scan task and, and I.O. transfer stuff. So that's basically what the Triton implant looks like and does. So it has four stages. It has an argument setter, uh, an implant installer, the backdoor implant, and then the missing OT payload. Uh, so the argument setter, it's not that interesting, but it basically controls the, the finite state machine of this thing, which does, at first, if you can see that properly, uh, it does uh, an exploit for privilege escalation, and then basically it relocates the, uh, the implant, the third stage. So the privilege escalation exploit, it looks complicated, but it's not. It's basically a write for anywhere because of um, improper uh, handling of, of memory privileges. Um, that allows you to write this address to uh, this, uh, this value to this address. And what does this mean? 
um, basically what happens is that once you invoke a system call on this particular firmware, uh, it saves the machine state register and when it returns it restores it and it is stored at this particular address that anyone can write to regardless of privileges. So if we overwrite it with this value, we set uh, bit 17 to supervisor privileges and escalate it. And that allows us to do these next steps to install the implant. The first of which is copying the payload into the firmware area of memory which allows us to achieve residence even if they wipe all the safety logic on the controller. Then we patch uh, uh, an entry in the jump table which uh, allows us to, uh, to hook a network command and then invoke our, uh, our implant when this particular network command is, um, is called. And then finally we patch a certain RAM check which was used for consistency between the firmware on ROM and in RAM which would otherwise mess with our, uh, our stuff. And this is basically the backdoor implant, like Marina mentioned, uh, it allows for reading, writing and executing arbitrary memory and basically allows you to overwrite this, uh, this key switch. So once you implant it, it doesn't matter what, what position they turn the key switch into, it allows you to uh, execute anything you want in memory. So you have persistence uh, on this device. So the, the fourth stage, which is, which is uh, the most engineering related, is the OT payload. And this was missing. Um, because this carries out the meat of the attack and we can only speculate what this might have looked like uh, and that's something we'll do. So because Triton is, is positioned here in the, the attack tree, the, the control and safety system, this is what the OT payload would have been related to. So basically um, it could have been, for example, an IO spoofing scenario. And that would have been a scenario that Marina would have uh, given to me and said, you know, we want to do spoofing of input and output values. As you can see, for example, here, uh, you have measurement values, they come as an input signal to the controller and as an output signal go to the instrumentation. And then we want to mess with either the input or the output to cause some unsafe state. Now internally, this looks like this on these devices. So you have the physical I.O., you have the logic, and there is an intermediary variable table that, that manages this. On the TriConnex, this is handled by an I.O. processor that has shared memory connection to the main microcontroller, and that's where it places this variable table. So we didn't have a TriConnex controller, but we did have a WAGO PLC, and I mean, it basically comes down to the same thing. Uh, it's an ARM Cortex uh, PLC running real-time li Linux. It has a vulnerability in the code sys runtime on TCP that you can explode uh, remotely and gain root. And basically what we do in our attack is we use the CPU debug registers to catch any access to this memory mapped I.O. And then we write a custom exception handler that gets invoked when this, this uh, debug trap is invoked. And we change the pin mode, for example, from output to input. So any writes that would be have been going to an actuator, like closing a valve, are now going to an input pin and they don't actually go out. And we have a little demo of this uh, that should be coming up. I'll, we don't have a lot of time, but... All right, so what you can see here is you have the WAGO PLC on the right, and then you have LED, which is our stand-in for, you know, a valve. And it's supposed to be blinking every couple of seconds. And now you can see it. Yeah, now you can see basically on the engineering uh, software, and the attacker will soon, yeah, I can't really skip anything here, but... Um, or should pop up like a shell at some point. <laughs> now you can see the LED blinking there. All right. Yeah, so, you know, this is a root shell on the PLC. We execute our payload, which is basically a Linux kernel module that does this uh, thing I just mentioned about the CPU debug registers. And then we stop it, and you can see the LED will stop blinking while it should be consistently blinking because it, you know, it now thinks it's an input pin. And then at some point, you know, we'll change it back again to an output pin, and then you can see it's starting blinking again. Right, if this was a valve, it would have been have an, had an impact. Now it's a LED and, you know, it's just a demo. So that brings us to the second possible payload, which is alarm suppression. So let's say we want to mess, for example, with, with uh, a chemical process like this, and our goal is catalyst deactivation. Now, um, 
industrial processes, they have alarms. So if, if something is about to go into an unsafe state or something is, is out of bounds, an alarm is raised somewhere in the process and these are propagated throughout the process and eventually lead to a safety shutdown. And as an attacker, we want to prevent this because we want the attack to continue. So how do we go about this? We can hide the alarms by compromising like the safety view or uh, the DCS uh, uh, view or some local HMIs. And this is the benefit of, of you know, hiding them centrally, but still these alarms go out as network traffic, right? And we don't want any kind of, of network inspection to see these alarms. So we want to suppress them either at the field level, the level of the field devices, or at the level of the safety controller itself, which is what TriConnex is. <laughs> So for TriConnect, you have Safety View, which is a PC-based HMI uh, solution. It allows for management and, and bypasses of all these alarms. And each HMI function is mapped to a TriConnect logic function block. And that looks somewhat, oh, that was a little bit too quick. That looks something like this. So you have, uh, for example, a water tank uh, level alarm here. You have a water high, a water low signal, and an aura of them raises an alarm. So as an attacker, these, these safety programs reside in memory as code, which is how we got you know, code execution in the first place. So the OT payload here could modify the instructions to set the alarm to a fixed false, regardless of the water levels that are coming as inputs to this alarm function. Uh, the attacker needs to know, of course, first where the program lives in memory and which instructions of the program to modify. Now, luckily for TriConnect, these programs are stored as a circular linked list in memory, as you can see here. This is actually our implant living in memory. And then you can walk this linked list and find the target program you want to modify. Uh, and this is what basically the, the alarm looks like. The, the core of the logic is a simple OR instruction, which the attacker can then, you know, hot patch. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's PowerPC, it's a risk architecture with a fixed instruction size, so we just set it to a fixed false there. It's relatively easy. And this is the result that comes out of it. On the left, you have normal functionality, you know, water is getting dangerously high, the alarm is going off. On the right, you have the exploited functionality, water is getting dangerously high, alarm is sleeping. All right. So, some more speculation. Why did this attack fail? Uh, I don't think we mentioned that, but uh, the attack was discovered because it failed uh, in, the, um, in the actual field. It caused a safety shutdown of the process. Um, there are a couple of, of, of possibilities. You could have had a Borg payload. Um, you know, the, the privilege escalation could have failed. They could have targeted a different firmware version than they actually uh, had, had developed the exploit for, which could have caused um, uh, an access violation. I mean, the backdoor allows for raw reading, writing, and executing of memory. Uh, they could have caused some memory corruption by an, uh, an, you know, uh, a payload that was written wrongly. Uh, they could have gotten into a fight with the watchdog. So very common on embedded systems, you have this watchdog timer, and you need to periodically kick it to, to uh, keep the counter high, because if the counter expires, it resets the CPU. Uh, or they could have missed some additional diagnostics. I mean, there's a ton of diagnostics functionality in here, and just because they patched uh, the RAM and uh, ROM check doesn't mean that they, they uh, patched everything rightly. These are all options. Another option is that they got into a fight with the triple modular redundancy. I mean, this, this is just the voting on the inputs and the output, but it, it's a very complicated uh, patent uh, that has a lot, that covers a lot of ground, and it could have been that the OT payload violated uh, something in the triple modular redundancy that in turn led to a safety uh, shutdown. And that brings us to the conclusions, which I'll give to Marina again. Well, we probably have just like a couple of minutes for conclusions. So just to summarize, like, so <clears throat> again, the purpose was also to go through this process of development in plans for the embedded system and see whether it is really that complicated. So what is the actual real threat? Is it also only for elite and we should not expect this type of attack or implant on a mass scale or it not? And apparently it is not. Not only that exploitation and implanting of industrial control systems relatively easy, like it's cheap because there is no any exploit mitigations, but also obtaining equipment relatively easy. We went through the process. Obtaining documentation is relatively easy. So you kind of have all of the needed components to um, uh, quickly obtain code execution and be able to backdoor this type of devices. So <clears throat> exploit development, again, uh, easy, if I will just go quickly through this, implant development, relatively easy. So for example, in the case of Triton, the attack already had privileges. Typically on industrial control system, you would not have pre, uh, like separation of privileges. So the attacker had privileges to escalate his privileges. Neat. So, <clears throat> 
However, for example, in case in uh, uh, safety system, you typically have this triple uh, like redundancy. Sometimes it's quadruple redundancy, which makes things a little bit complicated because you have to re uh, reverse engineer more. So the most difficult part which we were able to establish is actually developing OT payload. So basically, my task is harder. <laughs> um, and especially whenever we come together, like for example, yours and I come together, this is my wish list, and he already has an implant. This is where reverse engineering started get going further, and that is becoming more difficult. So, <clears throat> um, so uh, basically, so the open questions which we have, and this is, I, I think Yos has covered it very nicely, that it's probably the, just what we've seen is just one tool among uh, uh, many. Uh, uh, so basically development costs should be seen as relatively low. Uh, and uh, I think we should, what we definitely should expect relatively uh, soon is copy copycat. Security is a fashionable industry. So as soon as you, like for example, somebody will release a first ransomware malware, everybody will be designing ransomware malware. So this is what we're going probably to see. So many more other like state sponsored uh, threat actors will join this basically game. And again, it's not necessarily so. This is what like people think. On one hand, yes, it's easy to exploit. Then why don't we see a lot of those attacks? Because first of all, you have to have a motive. Why would you do that? And secondly, it's of course like crossing this red line. So on one hand, it probably will be something like the nuclear weapons. You will have the arsenal and maybe you will be showing the capabilities just in a slight ma manner. Like it has happened with power grid attacks in Ukraine. You just show that you are capable of, but you do not cause massive like damage which hurts. So you basically will be having it as a like uh, economical and political negotiation. So we wanted to thank a couple of people, including Felix Lindner. He was like a frequent DEF CON speaker who <clears throat> kindly uh, uh, help us to review the slides. Uh, we have the slides with a toolkit which you will need, and with that we are at the end, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.